Hey everybody, it's Justin Michael Williams and I am so excited for you to listen to this special interview with New York Times best-selling author, Catherine Woodward Thomas. She's the author of Calling in the One. I know you have heard about this book, all about finding your soulmate. And if you are somebody who has been either looking for love or you're in a relationship and trying to find out whether or not you're in the right love or the wrong love, you wanna listen very closely to this very special session. You know, this interview is a part of a series that we have going called The Kingdom. And you can listen to it on our podcast. We post videos here. You can also join us on social media to be a part of the conversation and get tips and tricks and all of the above. But for now, I hope you enjoy the interview. So I'm very excited to welcome to the stage our special guest, Catherine Woodward Thomas. Everybody, please give a hand to Catherine. Thank you, my friend. Ah, it's such a gift to be with you. So Catherine, her microphone, and we'll grab this too, so thank you, Tasha. And give it up for Tasha, who's our event producer. <laughs> so Catherine Woodward Thomas, everybody, if you don't know, I mentioned a few things. New York Times best-selling author, all over the world, your books are sold and read in languages and languages all over the world. The one that we're going to talk about today is called Calling in the One. I know a really popular one is Conscious Uncoupling. For people who didn't find the one, they found the wrong one. <laughs> Maybe they found the one that was right for a while and a certain piece of it, because we're all kind of yes. still in the myth of if you find your person, they should be forever. And if they're not forever, that somehow... It was you wrong. were wrong, or they were wrong, or yeah. it was wrong, or you were in fantasy. So we want to validate all love Amen. as being important. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. And so I want to get in today. We have such a gift to be with you today, and so I'm going to jump in pretty strong here. We have this quote of the month, and we'll have a quote every month. And this quote is great because it's from you. And you said this. I don't know if you remember saying this. <laughs> Healing is the domain of the past. And transformation is the domain of the future. Can, can we just lift the ones up? Okay, I see you on the chat back. Thank you. I'm going to say it again. Everybody say it with me. Healing is the domain of the past, and transformation is the domain of the future. What the hell does that mean? Okay. <laughs> so Werner Earhart once said, you must create the future that you desire from the future. Yes. Right, and Joe Dispenza is very clear. He says, don't tell me the story of your past. Tell me the story of your future. And a lot of us are looking to clear our relationship issues by doing our work, our inner work, connecting the dots, doing the healing work. My dad was this. My mom was that. She left. He was abusive. You know, and all of that stuff, if you can hold the complexity, is critical to do. Yeah, yeah. It matters when you do that kind of work. However, if you always are looking backwards to try and change your love life. <coughs> it was good you paused there because, listen, how many of you have been busy looking back, constantly looking back? That was divine intervention. It was divine intervention. <laughs> yeah, it was. Okay. It was. If you're always looking backwards, then you are in danger of over-identifying with the self that you formed in response to trauma. Hello. Hello. And so really quick, because I think one of the misconceptions that people get, and people come into our community all the time, I think one of the biggest things that people say they're trying to manifest, other than more money, is a partner. And one of the biggest misconceptions that I hear is people think they have to heal themselves first. They have to go back and heal everything, because if I only love myself, enough, or if I'm healed everything in my past, then I'll be ready or worthy of a relationship. You're saying that's not the way to go. I fell for that one, mm -hmm. hook, line, and sinker. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was in my 40s and had been working on myself for 20 years that I thought, maybe I'm missing something. Yep. Hello. Okay. Because How many of you have been doing healing work for about 15 years and still single? Right. Okay. I'm raising my hand, too. <laughs> so hello. Okay, so it matters to do all it that does work. Yeah, it yeah. really matters. We're not invalidating the work. But here's the thing about that. Some of the hurts in our heart, we will be healing for the rest of our lives. Yeah. <clears throat> like, if your father betrayed you, if your mother didn't love you, if she left, if he 
hurt you. Like those hurts will come up at different times yeah. when you get disappointed in life or it's a holiday or it's your birthday or, you know, it, it's spring is coming, you know, whatever it is that reminds you of that. So we have to learn how to be in relationship with those tender parts of ourselves and begin to deconstruct the meaning that we made of that trauma. Yeah. We're getting you some water, so hang tight. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, because happening. the when we were young, the task that we had at that point in our lives is to form an identity. Yeah. And to figure out where we were in the scheme of things on this planet. So if your mother was depressed and in her bedroom every day after you got home from school and you were all by yourself watching television day after day after day, you might have formed a self-sense, I'm all alone and yeah. no one is here for me. Yeah. And so to begin to hold that seven-year-old, to learn how to tend to that seven-year-old, because that self will come up intermittently whenever we get disappointed, whenever you know something happens externally. Yeah. So, tr so healing is its own domain. And we have to learn how to be in relationship with that part of ourselves that's been wounded so that we can create life outside of that And this story. is where the future comes in, right? This well, is where the creating yes, from the so future. Well, yes, so you start with the miracle. Because if you stand, if you've never had a healthy, loving relationship, and you kind of keep seeing the patterns of the past replay, you want to actually start with the miracle. Mm. You want to say, my intention and, and by the miracle, hold on, by the miracle, you mean what it is that you, if you could close your eyes and dream up whatever the just ultimate believe, love. You know, just like God had the best day of her life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she's like, oh, let's just create some love mischief for okay. Justin. Yeah. And we're just going to beam this like miracle energy. I'm and calling it suddenly in. <laughs> Justin's deepest desires are fulfilled. That's and what you mean by the miracle. The miracle, okay, like the it. best case scenario. Don't just go like... Well, I'd like to date a better, nicer people. Right. Right? Like, that's not really it. Or I'd like to love myself more so that when I have a relationship, I can love myself more. No, go for the gold. Yeah. Because Play a loving game. yourself more will be one of the steps that you'll need to do. Because here's the thing transformation is about development. Mm. You have to be interested in who you would need to be in order to manifest and sustain that future. Hello. And why the patterns keep happening is because when we got stunted inside of the false beliefs, we stopped growing yeah. certain skills. So I wanna, I wanna pause us there and ask you a really important question. Okay, I'm ready. Why would we ever wanna find a soulmate? Uh, like people assume, you know, it's like, oh, I, I should find my soulmate. But it, people spend so much time and energy doing this. Why would we actually want well, to Well, first this? of all, I think in the spiritual community, which all of us are a part of, there's a little bit of kind of a, an undercurrent of I shouldn't need anybody. Yeah. I should be able to, I should really be fulfilled all by myself. I shouldn't really want a soulmate. Maybe if they come, if they don't, there's this whole thing about when you stop looking, then you'll find the person, mm -hmm. right? So there's this whole, <laughs> there's this kind of myth in the space that somehow, uh, you know, purpose and actualization is the golden nugget, and you know, it's peripheral. Yeah. Whether you have a soulmate or not, yeah. but here's the thing: it's not pathological to yearn for love. And it's not coming from a needy part of us. It's actually wisdom. Can everybody in, in the chat type that in? It is not pathological to yearn for love. Can we say that in the room? It is not pathological to yearn for love. It is biological. It is built into us. It it's spiritual. It is built into us. Yeah, we, to love. Nature has designed us to actually regulate each other, to create well-being. As a matter of fact, from a neurological perspective, relationship is our safe space in the world. Yeah. And since we're talking about joy, when you have the right relationships and you have engaged all the growth that you need to engage to be well enough to begin to navigate to the higher potentials of love, because it's not about meeting the right person. You can meet the right person and bring the worst of yourself to that scenario Hello. because you get so captured by your anxieties and your fears about, you know, and your old beliefs that are unexamined that you somehow can't actualize the potentials. That's the heartache. And this is what you're talking about, about becoming. It's, it's this thing that we talk about here in the community a lot 
around you're asking for the miracle, you're asking for the vision, but who do we need to become to be ready to receive and hold the vision that we're actually asking for? So how you start to navigate your way to the higher potentials of love is you, you first of all, have to really be interested in who, what's the version of myself in that experience. Mm -hmm. You have to almost borrow against the future and bring the future into your now using your imagination. So this is where we go back to this quote. Right? Yeah. With the transformation is the domain of the future. So you're telling us go to the future yeah. to who you are being. Yes, because the future okay. will begin to pull you into who you would need to be. It actually informs your development. Like, golly, when I go into that future, who am I there? I can say no when I mean no. Or I can tolerate someone else saying no you know, and not getting my way and be respectful of that person. I can engage conflict directly. I can um, hold my own autonomy in the relationship and not just give my power away because I'm so afraid that someone's going to leave me. This is so powerful, Catherine. And there's something that you, I just want to pull out that, that we, we pinned in, uh, on page five of your book that I love. This is a quote from the, the first lesson on expanding your capacity to love and be loved. And it says, if you want to be ready to bring the one into your life, then you must be willing to grow yourself beyond the person you know yourself to be. Because the person you are today is the same person who created the experiences you've already had. So this is big. And so I, as I'm thinking about this, you know, many of us, we know how to look into our past. And I think we're taught, go to therapy, heal our wounds, go to the past. But we don't actually have a lot of practice at experiencing what it's like to stand in the future in this way. And so I, I, the main thing that I want to get to here is how do we, because people will say, well, I don't know what I want. I don't know what to imagine. So how can I see myself there if they're just based on all their old patterns? So how do you start to break through that? So calling in the one is, is actually a process. And we begin with the, with the hunger. And we validate the hunger for a, a, a beautiful love that lights you up and gives you joy and courage and strength and encouragement and is, is your safe space. And you might never have had that before. And so you have no idea. And as a matter of fact, you've been trying to create that forever. So we start from that future. We teach you a visioning practice about how to begin to move into using your imagination to try and get a sliver of what that might look like. Because even if 1% of you can catch that vision in your body, it's almost like I say, stick your foot in that opening, like mm -hmm. a door opening, like stick your foot in. It's like an elevator where you're like. Don't let it go. <laughs> it's, right. it's the elevator right there. All you need is like one exactly. little bit. Exactly. Yeah. You just need that one yeah, opening. Yeah, yeah. And when you do that, you can open the doors, yeah. right? So you're working with that. We're not, we're, we're turning our attention away from our kind of forever efforts to heal. And we're, we're leaning in towards like, you know, how would I need to grow? What would I need to let go of? How can I co-create that future? How can I, you know, begin to partner with the creative energies of life to bring forth this miracle? Because, you know, if you have a goal like you're going to write a book, you're going to get a master's degree, you're going to buy a house, like you pretty much can map out what you have to do to make that happen. You can't do that with true love. Right. right? You can try. <laughs> you can try. <laughs> Catherine, I want to, to go to a really important piece here that's something in your work that I have always really appreciated. And it's a section, I'm reading it very clear here, as seeing yourself as the source, mm -hmm. right? Seeing yourself as the source. And so the question I have for you is, what do you mean by that? And also, in context of what you're talking about, how do we see ourselves as the source of our situation without blaming and shaming ourselves about everything we've been through? Brilliant. This brilliant. is the, for me, this was, when I did your work, this was one of the biggest takeaways that I had ever yeah, had. It, it's, so thank you. So, so let's say you, you've had the courage to set an intention, you've called up your best friend, Justin. You said, OK, will you hold this intention with me and for me? He will answer you and say, I will hold you uh, uh, that intention with you and for you if you give me permission to hold you accountable for being who you would need to be in order to manifest that intention. And then the work of, you know, Michelangelo found David in the slab of marble, like chipping away everything that was not David. That's, what, that's how he described how he found yeah, David in, yeah. that, in that marble. So you start to chip away. And, 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 and the things that we're looking at are how you are actually the source 
of the painful pattern. So if you always find yourself with narcissists or addicts or you're alone for years on end, you know, we all have our tendencies in one direction or the other. And so you might say, this is how we're doing it now. Yeah, I'm alone for years. My mother, my father, I was a latchkey kid. My mother left me crying in the crib. So we well, go you know back. what else I hear? All the, my, I'm a Pisces, so this, oh, or my Pis human design says oh, yeah. this. Or my astrological chart, chart says it's going to be I five have years. No partnership. Yeah, all this kind of shit that we say, like we use all these, and I love all these tools. I love human design. I love no, astrology. No, I do too. But I they're not used to keep us in a cage, right? Well, you, used to so, us. so look, here's the thing. Life is fluid. We have to get that life is fluid and it's who we are being that's generating our experience in every given moment. And we are no more sacred in this, we were no more sacred before we incarnated than we are right now. Yes. And we have to get that because sometimes people say, well, I, this was set up before I came into the planet, I see my astrology. And I'm like, okay, but you have a say. You know, we have, we have significance in the universe. We create with our words. We create with our intentions. Mm -hmm. So that's where the miracles begin. All miracles are co-created. They don't just happen to us. They have to happen through, through us. us. So self is source. That's a quote. So, Hold on. Everybody type that in the one in the chat box. I got I to gotta <laughs> pause them on that. Miracles don't just happen to us. They happen through us. They have to happen through that's us. That's a quote. Everybody say that in the room. Miracles, Miracles don't, don't just happen, happen to us. us. They, they happen, happen through, through us. us. This is big. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So when it comes to self as source, so in calling you the one, we identify the pattern. And then instead of saying, well, you know, who's to blame, which by the way, if you go into your psychology long enough, you're just a victim of your own consciousness. So in, in calling in the one, we are like rigorous about non-victimization. How am I the source of this? Well, if I really look at how I'm keeping aloneness uh, alive in the space, and this was my actual own calling in the one process, how the, how the whole thing got created, is I recognized that I was self-sufficient to the T, very, very competent. I liked to work alone. I was the giver in most of my relationships with Joe, by the way, is the power position. So I wasn't really vulnerable, which means I wasn't really letting people into my inner world. I was just kind of being there for them. Another way that I was generating my own aloneness is I was conflict avoidant because I had this, you know, I'm alone, everybody's always going to leave me. So at the first moment of conflict, I was absolutely certain this was the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. And I would start giving my power away and start showing up inauthentically, which, oh, by the way, meant that I was leaving myself alone. I was self-abandoning. And then I was in a relationship in this really inauthentic way and not really myself. And it made it really easy for the other person to leave me because there was no there there. And oh, by the way, I found out later on that conflict is what actually bonds relationships. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So my relationships didn't bond deeply when I was conflict avoidant. So you have to see the choices you're making, the actions you're taking. And we all have, you know, reasons why we show up the way. My mom, I didn't know, and my mother didn't, and it wasn't safe. But until you're an adult and you're actually responsible for I show up this way, I, and you say it like this, I don't tell the truth in my relationships because I am unwilling to risk the possibility that someone might leave me. Mm. Because when I say it like that, then I'm like, How's that working for you? Yeah. And this is so big because what I, lo what I loved about this, Catherine, reading your book, and just so everybody knows, I went through the whole book, the whole process. It has transformed me from the inside out. And one of the main ways that it transformed me, I told you this, I was walking around telling everybody, I'm open, I'm ready for love. I read this book, I was like, oh my God, I'm so closed. <laughs> like, I thought I was open, right? Because I'd been doing what I thought was the work on my past and on my this to open myself up spiritually. And I realized I was as closed off as you can get, spiritually bypassing myself to think I was open. And the main thing that I wanted to get to here is when I read this work, what I love so much is you said, yeah, of course other people and what they've done impact and influence our lives. We're not negating that. But the only person you can actually do anything about is you. So take responsibility that you are responsible. You are the one who is creating. You are the source 
of your situation. I, rec I just want to tell you a quick story about this. I, I, when I was reading your book, and I've been waiting till this moment to tell you so I could be vulnerable and do it in front of everybody. So when I was reading your book, I recognized one of the main things, like one of my old stories, and I know you call this a, a, like a false love identity, which we're going to talk about in a moment. One of my old stories from growing up gay, in the closet, not accepted in my community, hiding it from my family, everywhere that I showed up, I had to pretend to be someone I wasn't to be loved, right? If I would be my authentic self, there was a risk that I wasn't going to be loved. And so this was my belief statement. And so what I did in all of my relationships is I was in these relationships where I felt like I had to prove myself to them. I had to prove who I was. I had to show up as some version. So whoever this person that I was in a relationship with wanted me to be, I would be. I would be that person. And what would happen in each relationship is I would end up in a position where they would say something like, I don't really feel you. Or I would be like, I'm losing myself to you. And I would be thinking that, oh, I'm picking the wrong guys. I'm picking guys that I can't connect with. But at the end of the day, I was never actually showing up as my full self because I was so afraid that if I showed up as my full self, I would be left. I would be abandoned. I wouldn't be wanted. And so I had to own that. Yeah, okay, of course, maybe I picked some guys who were not the best sometimes, but I still didn't show up as my full self. And had I, maybe I wouldn't have chose them in the first place. Or maybe I would have got out sooner, right? And so this was, it just showed me every situation, I was the source, I created this. And so this brings me to the concept of false love identity. Can you define what that is and true love identity so we can get into our practice okay. with this? Yeah. So the false love identity is the sense of yourself that was formed in response to trauma. So it's the traumatized self, and it's usually quite young. And uh, I also call it your source fracture story. Whatever relational trauma you experienced that seems to be showing up again and again, if you drop down in that moment where it happens again, the pattern just happened, you got rejected again, you didn't get invited, somebody ghosted you, whatever it is, you actually notice where it is in your body, and you can say to that part of you, sweetheart, how old are you? Right, so we drop down into a sense of ourselves as small, as unworthy, as unsafe, in some, in, in really in a breath, in an instant, usually in response to, usually in response to disappointment, but as I've deepened into it, I've also said, noticed that it's sometimes it's in response to our own dependency needs. Mm, explain what you mean by that. Well, you know, what nature has designed us to be interdependent. So if you're starting to get connected with someone, you'll start to suddenly, you know, notice when they're not texting or feeling the need to talk to them and you can't quite reach them or they're not calling you back. And that feeling of, I need to speak to this person or I need this person to acknowledge something that just happened. These are healthy needs, actually. I need reassurance. I need engagement. These are actually good, wholesome needs. But those of us who grew up in homes where we didn't get our needs met will very often go into just the need itself is dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous to need somebody. Because you know the whole love avoidant thing is that love is somehow unsafe. How many of you feel that? Anybody in here? Yeah, one's in the chat. I was very love that. avoidant. You know, love is dangerous in some way. So then you do all sorts. So you substitute drama for love is basically what you <laughs> yeah. do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, okay, so false love identity is the identity that we create. Yes, and then... True love. True love identity. Yeah. There's a part of us that's like the soul self, the spiritual self, the higher self, or just the healthy self, the healthy adult self. We know it's a story. We know it's not true. And you access that part of you quite quickly when your friend, your best friend, is suddenly, oh, I'm not worthy. And you go, are you crazy? Of course you're worthy. You're beautiful. You're a catch. Right? It's right on the tip of your tongue. Very often we forget to do that for ourselves. Hello. <laughs> we don't even Hello. know yeah. we're in a false center. Be why? Because we are so overly identified with our feelings that if I feel it, it must be true. If I feel small... If I feel unsafe, and we don't differentiate between the adult part of us that has a capacity to be objective, to think with our reasonable mind, 
where we know otherwise, we have all sorts of evidence to the contrary. And so very often, we will just kind of drop into the false love identity and start to generate life from there. That's that feeling like I'm five years old and I'm trying to be cool. <laughs> I'm trying to not show that I'm five. I'm pretending to be an adult here. <laughs> Which we all really know. We, yeah, it's we know. Torture. We've been there. Yeah, yeah. It's painful. And that's also the feeling of neediness because the neediness, all neediness is, is the healthy... Uh, impulse towards interdependence to get your needs met that is kind of anchored into a false center. Everyone always leaves, I'm not good enough. So if you're needy, you can just take a deep breath and again say, sweetheart, how old are you? Yeah. And what's the I am? What's the, what are you assuming is true right now? And then we transition into what is called the true love identity. Could we go into the practice and experience it? You guys want to experience yeah, it? Yeah, let's experience it. So we're going to do okay. a practice here called Transforming Your Love Identity. It's an incredibly powerful practice. We called Catherine and said, when you come, can you do this, please? And so this is a real gift to get this experience. Great. So let's have you all close your eyes if you feel that you're in a safe place to do so. If not, keep your eyes open. And just begin by taking a nice deep breath so you could breathe all the way down into your hips. Moving into a place of deep listening and receptivity, reverence and gratitude, the source of all joy. And I'm just inviting you to begin, actually, by connecting with the part of you that is holding wisdom, the part of you that has access to power and perspective, the part of you that is holding resilience and strength. Just connecting with the you that has been efforting your own healing and development for years by now. Growing your capacities, reaching toward the light. All inside of this deep inner recognition that you are indeed worthy of love. That you do indeed belong to all of life that you ha have been born into an experience of where you are destined to be connected and where you are inspired and encouraged and held in the light of love. Always given a way to move forward and expand into the fullness of who you came here to be. So turning your full attention to this part of yourself Breathing this part of yourself down through your legs, out through the bottoms of the floor, I mean, out through the bottoms of your feet, down into the floor, and out to the edges of the room, just taking up space with this healthy, higher self. This part of you that has access to wisdom beyond your years. And from here, I invite you to now connect with the emotional experience that happens for you when your pattern in love that has been chronically disappointing and difficult, whether you're in a relationship or you're not in a relationship. This is just as valid for those of you who are already in a relationship. It's the self that comes up when you get quote unquote triggered, when somebody lets you down when you feel unsafe in relationship, disappointed, when your feelings are hurt. And notice where that lands in your body. Notice that this is an old, ancient conversation that is so familiar. See, I'm not loved. See, I'm not safe here. See, I'm not wanted. And see if you can actually give that part of yourself the opportunity to name itself as an I am, or an I don't, I'm not, or I don't matter, I'm not enough, I'm all alone. This is the self that comes up when you're disappointed, when the pattern has happened again. And just extending your love to that self in your body as you name it 
not from your mind, but from your body. Asking yourself, sweetheart, how old are you? What's the story that you're holding about yourself and your relationship with others? And if you have more than one, just see if you can choose the one that brings tears to your eyes, that makes you feel like, ugh, that one again. I'm invisible. I don't matter. I'm not loved. Whichever one has the most energy right now, just extending love to this part of you and noticing how big the energy is. It's being held in this center that is just right there when you get hurt. And when you're ready, you can just open your eyes for a moment and shake it out, just shake it out. Move your body. Remember what you had for breakfast this morning, bringing yourself back into present time. Just saying to yourself, what is the very best thing about being me now as opposed to me then? I have power. I have perspective. I can choose differently. I can push back on that story. I can recognize truth. Right, Just connecting with your higher self, your healthy self. And when you have that centering again, just close your eyes and anchor that energy down through your body, out through the bottoms of your feet, down into the earth, out to the edges of the room. And this time I invite you to really go towards that younger you in your body. You might want to imagine you can put yourself on your lap or look into your eyes. And the first thing you want to do is say, sweetheart, you are not alone because I'm right here. Or whatever the story was, you are not unsafe. I'm here to keep you safe. I am the source of your safety. See if you can correct the relationship between the wise, mature part of yourself and that younger you that was so traumatized and took on this story as though it were real. And then I want you to tell the truth to that part of you. You are more than worthy of love just as you are. You need do nothing to prove your value. Your feelings and needs matter. They matter to me, and it's appropriate for you to expect them to matter to others that you let into your life. You are wanted by all of life. All of life conspired to get you here in spite of your ambivalent mother. If it was an I'm invisible, I came here to be seen. It is my destiny to have an impact, to be visible in this world. Speak words of truth and own them in your body from the center that is deeper and wider and send love to that younger you. And see if you can create a power statement that really anchors you in the deeper truth of your own worthiness, of your own inherent sense of belonging. And if you don't know how to show up in a way that would be consistent with that, just say to yourself, I have the power to learn how to keep myself safe. I have the power to learn how to create loving relationships that are deep and real and true. I have that power. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Just take a second to let that land. So when you're centered in that younger, tender, wounded self, you will show up in ways that tend to generate evidence for that story. And it will happen outside of conscious awareness because we are the creators. We are co-creators with life of our experience. 
So we always want to be aware when I dropped into that center and take on the practice of shifting centers so that we can navigate difficult moments, challenging moments, where there's irreconcilable difference or somebody does do something hurtful. That's your adult self that knows your own value that can navigate that moment. That's not the five-year-old traumatized self. So we have to distinguish between the traumatized self and the true self. How many of you felt deeply in this practice? Felt deeply. One's up. There's tears in the room. If there's tears at home, I invite you to feel into that. We are going to stay in our hearts for a moment and do a, a song that I think will help us let this land in our spirits a little bit more. So Catherine will be right back to join us. And I'll invite our choir and band back up. And I just need the mic, not the stand. Thank you. And this is one of those moments where we feel the music as medicine, as medicine. And so see if you can let this land in your heart and open up this space of you giving yourself permission to fall in love with the desire of that miracle that's showing up in your life, that is showing up in your life, and also the love that you are cultivating for your own self and where you are, and that tender part of ourselves exactly at the same time. Whenever you feel called, I invite you to sing along. calling love into your life. Sing this with us. Fall in love with yourself and what you're calling in.
as we call this sense of love into our lives, as we give ourselves permission to fall in love with love, to fall in love with the miracle, to fall in love with ourselves. As we take each other's hand and go on this journey together. Thank you, choir and band. Catherine, welcome you back up. So, Catherine, there is, um, I'm going to actually skip forward <clears throat> to get some questions from people. Great. And so yeah. if there is a question, we're going to take, we have a special segment that we've created now in the kingdom that you all will all love. And I'm just going to skip, 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 because I'm going to come back to this. Excuse me as I try to skip in the slides. Or, okay, there we go. Called 333. We like these numbers, right? Three, three, three. <laughs> so there's a little time constraint on it, but it's really important. It's three questions from three people in three minutes each. So your question, if you want to get an answer from Catherine, you need to ask it fast <laughs> so that she can have some time to respond because I will be having a timer. We'll be watching the time. And so we'll take one question from someone in this room. We'll take one question from somebody who's watching live online. And so if you have a question, now's the time, and I know Kate's been giving us the information about this, to type in your questions into the question section on Crowdcast. And then those of you who are looking at the questions come in, you can actually thumbs up or upvote a question. And the question that gets upvoted the most is the one that we're going to ask. And then we also got a question from people who listen to the podcast and who are on social media that somebody wrote in a question that we've already picked. So we'll start with one in the room. I, Olga's hand went up like this. <laughs> Just so fast. So Olga has a question. Can we get Olga a mic or do we need to? Okay, so I'm going to just have her use your mic for one yeah. second. Okay, so Olga, what's your Thank question? Thank you so much. And Catherine, wow, what a practice. What a gift. Thank you. You got three minutes, girl. Okay. <laughs> My question is, if you have a person in your life who you see going through very terrible patterns, who is just keep choosing the wrong, you know, just not understanding this beautiful wisdom that, you know, that you share, and they just... How do you convince them? How do you bring them to the point where they they see that there is a better path, that you know th there is they deserve better? Like what? How do I? How do you help someone else? Help start somebody. To step into this yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that I've trained myself to do is to really notice all of these ways of relating and ways of being that are kind of habitual to us. And one of the things I want you to think about is that you had a moment with me where you could ask anything and that you asked about someone else. OK? No judgment on it, but just notice that. Um, consciousness is relational. And the best thing that I think we can do for those that we love is to live the work ourselves and to um, be a demonstration of the work. And what that might look like, you know, when people really do this work, they start to occur for other people as kind of unrecognizable. So can I just play with you a little, Olga? Is that OK? Because I know that you're really kind, and I want you to be my best friend, who, when you get the microphone, you ask about how you can help Catherine. <laughs> 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 and we'll keep it tight, because we got three minutes. OK, okay, okay. cool. Okay. Let's go. Um, I gotta keep the so what keep that it. might look like from you is that you start to um, keep your primary focus here on yourself and what you feel and what you need, and you start expressing that more because you have a high sensitivity to the feelings and needs of others and a very deep heart, but that you begin to love yourself so much and you begin to be more visible about what you feel and what you need such that everyone around you says, I don't even recognize Olga anymore, but I feel like I just met her for the very first time. So. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Olga. Did you get what you need? Yeah. So. Say a little bit right about that. <laughs> <laughs> Olga's like, and I got red. <laughs> All right. Okay. So the second question actually um, comes from somebody, and this this is a question that I almost didn't ask. 
Um, and then I realized, as I was talking to some people about this, it came in on social media, that um, a lot of people have this question and they're embarrassed to ask the question. Okay. And, so I, and so I felt, you know what, I'm gonna just ask this one. So um, this one comes from a woman in our community and she asks, while I'm looking for the love of my life, is it okay if I'm having sex with other people? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Because people balance people, this, right? It's like I'm calling in the one, so I'm, I'm being celibate, or I'm this, or I'm that. So what do you believe? And you get different dating advice. It's kind of crazy making, right? So mm -hmm. you get some dating, real diehard dating advice. Don't sleep with anybody. Clean your energy up. Really, and then and then you get the other person, the opposite. No, you don't want to get too attached. So sleep with a lot of different people and wait till that person's committed. So I don't take a hard and fast rule on it because calling in the one is different for each of us and it depends where we are in our journey. So some of you, you know, when you're when we're gonna do a practice towards the end that becomes the challenge. And one of the things we're asking is what's my next step to co-create this possible future? And it might be to be more open sexually and to take the gift of sexuality and sexual experiences with people. That might be your own intuitive guidance and what you might need to say to create safety about that so you're not getting all confused like you think that sex means you're solidifying some kind of commitment and then you get devastated. So what would create integrity around that experience? But it also might be that you need to stop sleeping around and claim the, the sacredness of your temple and begin to get your body ready for your beloved. So is the way that you, just to follow up on this, like is the way that you make that decision about what pathway to take, is it by stepping forward into who you are in the relationship and? Well, who you, so everything's about being in integrity with the future you're committed to. Yeah. So when you're, when you're calling in the one, you're visiting the future a lot. You're trying that future on. And then you're finding your way to that future and you're letting go of everything that's not that. Resentment, where you're blaming other people, which means you haven't yet taken responsibility for your part, which, oh, by the way, means you actually won't trust yourself to let somebody else in. Or old agreements, your loyalty to your sister who's not well and will probably not partner and you don't want to leave her alone or whatever outdated loyalty might even be to a loyalty like on there to yourself where you took a pledge I'll never let anyone hurt me like that again or a toxic kind of dynamic that's very important in your family or your close friends where you're kind of showing up as a din down version of yourself you're out of integrity you're giving your power away to someone those are all the things you need to start cleaning up in your relational field and then, of course, living from the true you. Yeah. So that's what you're letting go of in order to be in integrity with that. And that's how you're measuring every action you take, every choice you make, is is it in, in integrity, integrity with and alignment that I'm calling with that for. future? And we're going to get to practice this in our Kingdom Challenge in a moment. So the third question, this is really fun. It, it, so what, the way that we're doing it on the Kingdom now is people type in their questions, and then everybody who's watching gets to vote up and say which one they want answered. And the one that got voted to the top is from my mom. <laughs> It's great. It's from my mom, Barbara. So, hey, mom. We calling in some love. So, my mom's question is actually one, I, I find it so beautiful. Um, mom, I find this very beautiful. And so, she said, if I missed my soulmate because I wasn't ready, what's next? Or did I miss my chance? What do I do if I wasn't ready when, my, when somebody who I experienced as my soulmate was I they, my presence? I love that question. It's deep. You know, I think a lot of us feel that pain. I had that person and I blew it. Um, so one of the things that I really help us all to focus on is we're in a process of, of growth and you almost have to outgrow who you were when you formed that dynamic with that particular person so that you are more capable of depth and true intimacy in your relationships moving forward. So life is ever recreative. Mm -hmm. And so we do miss opportunities a lot and, and life itself seems to be quite gracious and ever kind about that and ever uh, available to recreate a different future. So I would encourage you to, in your visioning, which we're gonna do in just a little bit, is to hold some of the nuggets, the golden, beautiful nuggets of that connection and say this and, and the pieces that we're missing. Yeah, and more, right. yeah, beautiful. It's not about that person, but it is about those, remember, 
that person is not the source of those qualities. Mm. Life is the source. And mm -hmm. you can recreate those qualities and more in your next partner. Yes, and there are more. There's not just, what you're saying too, is it's not just that one person. There could, there's multiple opportunities for yes. life to bring you and in terms of the agreement, you might look at the agreements you made with that person because agreements that we make, like I'll never love anyone like I love you, you know what I mean? Even if you imagine, never said it to them, even if it's an energetic even if you agreement just in your thought head, it, yeah. it serves as an intention in the universe. Yeah. So you have to get conscious of the agreements that you've made and then just complete them inside yourself. Inside yours. Well, I actually, when I was doing Calling in the One in the book, I talk about my high school boyfriend, Frank. I remember this. Oh, I mean? I remember this. An agreement. This. I was so crazy when I broke up with him. I'm 18. What do I know? I said, well, when we're in our 60s, we'll get together and get married. And then, of course, he married the next person and had children with her. But I'm still in the back of my mind. Oh, maybe one day. Blah, 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 blah. So I, I, 20 years later, after dreaming about him for years, I hadn't talked to him in years, but I called him into my meditation. I didn't want to call him. He was still married to that lovely woman. And so I called him into my meditation, and I had a conversation. I'm not going to keep this agreement. It's preventing me from being really, truly open. I'm sorry for hurting you. I love you. What's the oponopono? I love you. Yeah. Please forgive me. Thank you. I'm sorry. You know, it's a beautiful poem. So I woke up. I mean, I got out of the meditation, I felt free. I ended up manifesting this beautiful love. Do you know I spoke to Frank like eight years later? because I wrote about him in the book, and then the book was successful, so we heard about the book, and then we connected, and we had this really great heart-to-heart. -heart. And he hadn't read the book. He was just a friend who'd read the book and told him. So, he, so I, you know, we're having this, I'm sorry. It was actually very emotional. And, and I said to him, he said, you know, I dreamt about you too. And I said, really? He said, oh, my gosh, for years I dreamt about you. I said, when did they stop? He said, mm, eight years ago. When she broke the agreement. So this is that's what's really important. So it okay. I'm gonna let that. I'm gonna okay. let that. I'm gonna drop <laughs> that, that one mom, right there. Okay, that was for mom. There, great. Okay. So this brings us into our challenge, right? How do we actually bring this into our life? And we've been teasing this concept for a little bit. And so I'm gonna go back to these questions. And every month, Samsey, would you mind? Okay, I think I got it. This seems to be low battery or something. So the kingdom challenge. We're gonna have a challenge every month that you just do. The container is you try to do this every day, as much as you can between this kingdom and the next one. And we'll be following up and keeping each other accountable in soul study. And I just want to remind you all kind of the actual science of habit building. So you all know, many of you know if you're new here, I'm half very woo-woo, got crystals, prayers, the whole thing going on. I'm half a total neuroscience psychoeducation geek. I love the science of how all this works. The science of habit building proves again and again in all the most major studies that if you fall off track, meaning if you skip a day, as long as you are compassionate with yourself and don't shame and blame yourself, and you just get right back on the horse, like, oh, I skipped a day, no big deal, back on the horse, it actually has no long-term effect. The long-term effect in habit building comes from beating ourselves up. That's actually where the impact comes from. So I'm giving this to you as a challenge, but also as an experiment with your life and with yourself. So we love this kingdom challenge because Catherine, I'm gonna have you talk us through it because you talk about this right at the beginning of your book. You have this amazing moment, and I think it's on page three or something like this. I'm gonna I'll pull it up here. This amazing moment with, um, oh no, it's on page 21, with Reverend Michael Beckwith, who we love so much. And uh, you got these questions that you started to embody. And so I think if we could just review the questions very briefly, and then do a, a quick experience so people can have it, and then you'll know that this is the practice that you do. It'll take you just a couple minutes every day, and we'll see what happens, what magic unfolds over the next several weeks. So. Okay, beautiful. So we start with a possibility, right? What's, what's the possibility that's calling to you? What do you yearn to create? And you set that as an intention, and then we're going to go into beginning to try that on in our bodies. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? You're, so you're visiting the self of your future. And from that state, you ask three questions that were inspired by my, by my friend, our friend, Michael Beckwith. What will I need to give up? You're asking the universe, what will I need to give up in order to manifest this possible future? And you listen. Because that's a great question. You're going to need to give up your defenses. You're going to need to give up you know, 
indulging self-criticism, you're going to need to give up smoking. You're going to need to move out of that toxic situation and get a new place to live. You will hear what you need to give up when you ask the question. It's not a burning bush. It's just a hunch or an instinct, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't invalidate the and answer. And this is why that meditation is so important too, because it helps us center in and be able to start listening to that voice inside of yourself. And then the next one, Michael says, "What will I need? What will I need to embrace?" And I've kind of grown it to be, "How will I need to grow?" Yeah, I love that. What skills am I missing that I would need to begin to cultivate? What capacities will I need to grow? So, what will I need to embrace or cultivate? How can I grow myself in today in the direction of my dreams? And you will also, when you just sit with that question, begin to get a sense. You know what's missing and how you need to grow. And then the last one, what is my next step to co-create this possible future? You always want to be in action. One of the problems with our very psychologically sophisticated culture, or sophisticated culture is that a lot of us go back into the past, and then we just kind of sit there analyzing. There. Yeah. You have to be in action to break up the false center. Like one of the things I did to break up aloneness is I, I created a project what I couldn't possibly do by myself. <laughs> I needed other people. You just are kind of radical in breaking up the kind of pull into that old story and you begin to show up outside of who you've known yourself to be to co-create that possible future. This is beautiful. So step one, first step is we set the intention, yeah. right? What is the miracle that we're manifesting in our life for love? Or in our life period. And then what do you need to give up? Where do you need to grow? And what is the next step? And I love I, you know, the word next step, right? So it's not like, give me the whole action plan no. for the next year. It's well, what this, is the next step from where well, I'm at now? Again, if you're going to go and get you know, a PhD, you can figure out the whole path before you make a move. And this is where a lot of us get stuck because we trust linear, logical thinking over next step. Sometimes it's like a crazy thing to do. Next step, like really go to that dance class? People like are sweaty in that dance class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And next thing you know, you walk in and you meet somebody who meets somebody who introduces these are the things that we can't plan and we don't know. So what I would love, Catherine, is if we could go through a very brief version of that as a practice together so that people have an experience of it. And this is the practice that you will do once a day, every day, every single day, as we lead into the kingdom going forward. And if you skip a day, be nice to yourself. But you know. We don't reach our dreams by half-assing it. So try. There you go. Commit, okay. not try. Here All we go. Right, so let's close our eyes again. Take a nice deep breath as though you could breathe all the way down into your hips. And actually connect with the intention that you are setting to manifest and sustain this deep sense of love, safety, co-creativity, mutuality, joy, in your relationship and begin to imagine what it might sound like to hear your beloved so joyfully singing in the shower or chatting on the phone to someone they love in the next room. Maybe hear the two of you giggling together Imagine that you are making juice together and see if you can taste the freshness of it. Imagine your beloved doing something kind like cooking your favorite dinner and tasting that, smelling the flowers they brought you, just deepening this sense of I already have this incredible clear, clean love that is an expression of safety and joy in my life. God's blessing. And again, taking a deep breath, just receiving that possibility, even if only 1% of you thinks it could possibly happen, just turning your full attention there and beginning to notice who you are in that future fulfilled. You are loved, you are seen, you are heard, you are supported, you are healed, you are respected. Just trying on this version of yourself. 
And again, a deep breath and just asking the universe now, thank you so much for this possible future. What will I now need to let go of in order to manifest this miracle? What will I need to release and let go of? Just listening for the answer. And now asking the universe, and how will I need to grow myself so that I am ready for this date with destiny? I am ready to receive this level of happiness, co-creativity, health, and well-being in the form of my beloved into my life. How will I need to grow in my relationship with myself in my relationship with others. And finally, just asking life, and what is my next step? What can I do today to begin to weave this possible future into the manifest world? And just listen. And whatever comes to you, you need to clean out your closet. You need to have a conversation with someone. You need to write a love letter to your beloved and put it under your pillow. You need to throw away those old love letters. Just make note of it and actually put it in time. Notice what you are going to do within the next 24 hours so that you and life can co-create this miracle together. Thank you so much. Amen. We're doing a real applause here. Catherine, thank you so much. Everybody, please give some love and gratitude to the incredible, I need a hug from you. Catherine Woodward Thomas.